What did you see first? The lady, she was your size. Whoever shot her made sure that her face will never be shown. When we picked up the stretchers, we were walking in between grenades and, and RPG rockets. It's a war zone. It's like what you hear and see and smell. It's like all got into a package of weird Mad Max war zone. Now we're sure that we're starting at the end of the world. That's the visual I had. Everything is, it's done. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Lila Rose podcast. For those of you who follow me on social media, on Twitter or Instagram or Facebook, some of you might have noticed that I have been commenting more in the last several weeks on the Israel-Gaza war right now. And there's a lot of varied opinions on the politics of this. There's a lot of varied opinions on what's happening. My guest is Tomer Peretz. He is a artist from Los Angeles, originally born in Israel, a dual citizen. He is a father and a husband, and he happened to be in Israel for personal reasons during the time of October 7th. And Tomer Peretz was one of the first responders with Zaka, a volunteer organization, to find the bodies of the dead in the massacre, both the dead Israelis and the terrorists, to find them and to give them a proper burial. So you will hear in this his firsthand account, as well as his view of the events that are unfolding. Tomer is going to be candid about what he saw in the days following October 7th. This is not easy to listen to. If you're listening to this with children, I urge you to wait for a time when you're not with your kids to listen to this. It is mature content. But I think it is something that every single person, adult, should listen to, should learn, should know. Because what is happening in Israel and Gaza has huge implications for us in America too. It has implications for the entire West. It is a question of civilization. It is a question of right and wrong. It is a question of Will we allow dehumanization, terrorism to have its day and to spread? Or will we join others in condemning it? Seven Weeks Coffee is America's pro-life coffee brand. This is organic gourmet, low acid coffee that's ethically sourced. You can find any roast or blend that you like. And the best part of sevenweekscoffee.com is not just that steaming cup of hot coffee that's gonna be so delicious. It's going to be the fact that 10% of your purchase goes directly to support the Pregnancy Care Center movement. That means 10% of your dollars go directly to pregnancy resource centers to help mothers and babies in need. So when you go to sevenweekscoffee.com, use the code LILA at checkout for 10% off your order. You're going to support the pro-life movement as well as get an amazing cup of coffee. So join me at sevenweekscoffee.com in drinking America's best coffee and America's most pro-life coffee. Tomer Peretz, thank you so much for joining the podcast. Thank you for having me. So it's I've been pleasure. I've been following your Instagram account now for several weeks when I first found out about it. So first, for the folks listening, introduce yourself. You're an award-winning artist from Los Angeles, and give us some of your background. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a I'm a husband and a father, mm -hmm. and I have three kids. Awesome. I've been um, I grew up in Israel um, until the age of 22, I was in the military for four and a half years. And I moved to Los Angeles to pursue my uh, art career. Mm -hmm. And I've been doing that for the past 18, 19 years, alongside raising a family. And, and yeah, everything was amazing up until October 7th, you know, that flipped all of our life over. You, you were in Israel on October 7th. Why yeah. were you, why were you in Israel then? So uh, I went to attend a wedding um, of my cousin and uh, I took my two young boys uh, like for like an extra fun boys trip. My uh, my uh, son Roy, he broke his elbow during the summer and he couldn't get um, into the ocean or swimming pool. So it was a great opportunity for him to um, uh, take advantage on this trip and have fun. So I took uh, Ziv, he's five years old and Roy is uh, nine. And we had an amazing time up until October 7th. <laughs> so tell me about the morning of October 7th. When did you first hear or find out something was wrong? I was... Um, and where were you? We were in uh, Kerem Atemanim in uh, Tel Aviv. We had an um, uh, amazing Airbnb apartment by the ocean, walk, walking distance. And um, on Friday, we were on the beach with my friends from the military time. And it's funny, it was so ironically that we spoke about Gaza on Friday. 
mm-hmm. and the time we served in Gaza. And then on um, uh, Saturday morning, I woke up uh, into the sirens, the alarm went off. And right away when I opened my eyes, I'm like, oh my God, I'm in Tel Aviv and alarm went off. This is un- unusual. Um, I pulled up my phone right away through, um, you know, I, I ran to the safe room, obviously. My two young boys, Roy and Ziv, were there with their iPads already. And my nephew also was with us that night. He slept over. Um, so I'm like, hey, like, you, you guys hear? It's the alarm went off. So my son didn't even, both of my kids didn't even look at me. Only my nephew, who lives in Jerusalem, uh, looked at me and was like, yeah, uh, Tomer, what's what's going on? I'm like, so I guess uh, there is a terrorist attack in south of Israel and uh, some terrorists infiltrated into Israel. Then my middle son raises his head above the iPad and he's like, dad, what's a terrorist? Wow. And then I just like, I'm like, okay, I forgot I'm talking to a five and nine years old who they don't even, they never heard those words at home, never. Growing so, up in LA. Growing up in LA, they he doesn't even understand what is that mean. So I don't even know how to explain the definition of it. It's like, so I got stuck and I'm like, okay, never mind. Just go back to your iPad, <laughs> no, just enjoy your game. That's the moment when I realized that I, um, um, as of right now, I'm gonna lie <laughs> about everything until I will you know how to explain it and that away. Um, and like everybody else, we were home that day and I was, you know, I, all of my friends from the military, um, of a few, I was already, some of them, they drove down North, like they, so I, I was serving in, in, in Golani and, and before I was a uh, special ground forces in Sayyid Golani. So it's, it's a very high rank unit, but they going to be probably the first people going to get a call if something happens. So, um. Um, everybody went on uniform and I was one of the only friends that came to visit from other country and watching the news. So that was the moment when I felt that I, I needed to do something. So I texted every person I knew in Israel, how can I help with the beginning of the war? It was already a few hours. And the first people who got back to me were, uh, friends from, uh, Zaka. What is Zaka? So Zaka is a nonprofit organization that uh, specializing with rescue and clearing, evacuating dead bodies to bring them to respectful religious Jewish barrier. Um, so um, I know Zaka from the '90s in Jerusalem. Um, I um, I was around. Uh, the terrorists attacked in a um, uh, restaurant uh, Sbarro in Jerusalem. It was in the nineties, and um, and um, I remember the, the talk about them that they're scratching body parts from explosions in order to bring the body parts into uh, to bury those those parts. I guess by the Jewish religion, we need to bury we we bury everything. The, the blood stains, the body parts, the, the, the ashes, if there is ashes. And so, um, that's their job. This is what they do. And they do it the full, fully volunteer, um, with no salary payment or fame. So it's kind of like a work of mercy. It's a, it's a special ministry. It's, uh, you know. For some reason, I have a hard time, and it's kind of sad. I have a hard time to describe these people because it's the most pure, pure, holy people that I've ever seen in my life that do this thing from the sake of the mitzvah, and they understand that most people cannot do it, and they understand how important is it. So they do it with quietly, not talking around and in a very quietly, like nobody knew who are them unless you live in Jerusalem or in Israel. Um, and by the way, they don't operate only in Israel. They operate all around the world. Uh, they have an international team that it was, by the way, that was the friend who brought me in. Mm-hmm. He's in the international team. So the guy was saving life in 
Turkey, saving life in Ukraine. He saved lives in Haiti after the earthquake, uh, after that they went to the tsunami in uh, Thailand um, years ago. Um, they, they, they're, they're going to every disaster around the world to save lives. Basically, wow. basically and 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 take care of dead bodies to get them to bury even if they're not jewish so zaka doesn't operate only in israel so so you heard back from your friend who was part of zaka that that day of october 7th what happened next he he, he called me like as soon as he saw the text he called me very quick he's like hey i didn't know you were here da 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 uh, I want to see you, but see, it's like crazy that I'm like, bro, I want to go like, take me. I, I, I can't sit at home. Like, listen, Tomer, you know, it's, it's, it, it, it's not something we can do. I'm like, yes, you can. I know who are you. I know you can do it. And he just didn't argue with me and, and they picked me up the day after. And let me tell you something. No one, no one could volunteer to Zaka just like that at the beginning of a war. It doesn't work like that. I don't know. Um, I think they really needed help that moment. Um, and it was uh, chaotic. So so I think they just, okay, come, just help us. And they picked me up on Monday morning already. Before getting into the events of what you saw when you started to volunteer with Zaka in the south of Israel, you made this comment earlier about the safe room. And this is anyone listening to the reports about Israelis, you know, running from rocket fire from Hamas, they hear about safe rooms. Can you explain what the safe room is? And it sounds like the nephew you had, he's used to going to the safe room. Is this a part of everyday life for Israelis? So um, it depends what part in Israel you live in. So the people who live in the South, they're daily basis. It's like, they're so used to it, the kids and babies, like older people, everybody knows, and they jump into the safe room on seriously weekly basis. But um, not if you live in Jerusalem. Jerusalem don't have those alarms because the rockets that basically are firing from Gaza, uh, most of them are reaching the south part of Israel, m most of them. Depend what rocket is it, depend how aggressive they want to go, the Hamas. Seifum is a room in every house and building and neighborhood around the entire country that Israel invested to build for the citizens in order to protect the citizens from uh, bombs, rockets, anything. So a safe room is built from concrete, I guess, still, I don't, uh, I don't know, but um, it built to protect you from, from bombing in certain level. Um, and that's the room where you run into when you get, um, the call, it's, a, there is an app that every person in Israel is connected to. So you get the alarm on the phone and you hear it outside, but in probably in some parts, you don't hear it outside on the street. So you, you get it on your phone. Everybody in Israel, actually, m most of the people I, I, I saw, they get it on their phone and they mm -hmm. kind of through the phone, they, they, they know where to go and, and they know where is the actual rockets are going to, because the app is telling you south, north, middle, this, this, this city, or this city will leave. So when the alarm goes off, you connect it to the phone and it tells you what part of the, the country should go into the safe room. Um, so my, my nephew was not used to it. Mm. It was very new to him, actually. Um, actually he was in the north or near Jerusalem. He, he, lives, in Jer he, he, he lives in Jerusalem. That's where my brother lives. So he, with his family, they live in Jerusalem. I was in Tel Aviv with him, which is 45 minutes away from Jerusalem, up north. And, um, and, the, and the rockets were firing also to Jerusalem. I think, I think, don't quote me on this one, first time. Um, and Tel Aviv, the, like a big part of Israel. On October 7, big part of um, um, mid-Israel, central Israel in the south, uh, got attacked by uh, those rockets. Uh, and up north, got attacked by uh, the Hezbollah from Lebanon. Wow. Hezbollah took over south of Lebanon years ago, and they fired. So um, I would say 
maybe the entire Israel was in safe rooms at uh, that moment. Um, but he was he, he didn't know what's going on. He knew about that. He understand it, but he never experienced that. So I think he was the only person who was afraid because my my kids had no idea what that, what, what is it. It's like didn't even think about that. Um, so he was on it. Like he understand everything. So the day that you first volunteer with Saka is that Sunday the ninth? Monday. Monday, the Monday, Monday the ninth. Monday. So Saturday we were stayed a whole day in uh, Tel Aviv, and then Sunday morning we decide to uh, leave the Airbnb apartment and go to my parents and my parents in law who are in Jerusalem. Um, and um, um, and that was a time when I was like expecting already to jump on a car to go help some somewhere. Um, I even checked to uh, go into reserve. I don't do reserve since the military from PTSD reasons and because I left Israel. But um, I wanted to do anything. And they could pick me up only on, uh, on Monday morning. So what happened on Monday morning? Where did you go first? So Monday morning, I uh, was like 7, 8 a.m. And they picked me up from Jerusalem. I, got, I jumped into the car. They were on the phones already. They drove fast. Um, they got uh, the first operation for, it, it's called uh, uh, Eagle Team. So um, it's uh, th that's the name of the team that I was uh, belonged to. And uh, the first operation was to go to um, um, the Nova site and pick up all the stretchers that, was, that were left on site from Saturday. And they said, we cleared out all the ju ju the Jewish dead body from the site area and, and just pick up the stretchers and come back to Kibbutz Beri because now we are starting to clear out Kibbutz Beri from the dead, from the dead bodies. And um, that's what we did. And I, um, 15 minutes before we arrived, everybody pulled up their guns and they were ready for attack because rockets were firing on top of us like the whole time, the whole time. And we were like, Every few minutes, we're getting out of the car, hiding, going back with the car, keep driving, booming out a rocket, going outside, hiding. So it's like a continuation of the whole week. It was like that uh, for me. It, even up until now, I was there the whole week. So um, then we um, picked up the equipment from the Nova Festival, which that, that, was, that was the moment when I understand that mentally physically i'm in a war zone what did and you see when you first got there so uh we drove on 232 uh we called that the death road that's the main road where all the nova uh, uh all nova people went, wanted to run away from that was the only road that you can you can drive and that that road was blocked by the Hamas and they firing they fired RPGs on every single car there. So I the first thing I saw was burned, completely burned cars after explosions. Hundreds. Hundreds, not like four or five. Like every car. And a car were flipped and a car were like like a like got into accidents, both of them burned. It's, it's like a, a lot of weird, like what happened to those cars? You know, it's the first question that came to my mind. I'm like, you hear about a massacre. And when you hear about a massacre, you think about like a mass shooter, right? Mass shooter, AK-47, whatever, right? And just shooting everybody. That was not the case. They were firing grenades, RPG, Lao rockets, which is um, um, a shoulder rockets. Um, different, different, uh, bigger machine guns, bigger things than just a rifle. And there were people in those cars. Yeah, people. No, not soldiers. People like people that went to dance, celebrate peace and love Nova Festival for over four thousand um, um, people, young, twenty years old, thirty years old. Um, and, um, um, what I got there, um, you know, the tanks, 
because we already were in the war. So the tanks created the dust and the dust is like covering your, your, your vision. So there is no sky. You don't see the sky. You see only orange, foggy, dusty, um, background. And you see the birds are looking for, like the crows are flying and look, looking for the dead bodies. And they're saying, you see where the birds are going, probably there's a dead body over here. And we got into the, the festival site and you see Hamas dead bodies, like in a bunch of places with full uniform. The military didn't even remove the explosive grenades and RPG rockets from them. So you, you see the complete package in front of you and they were full weapons on them. It's like they're 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 about to conquer. They're about to fight with the secret service or whatever, and they were actually fighting fighting. They were actually killed kids who went to dance. So it doesn't match. Like it doesn't like you know like all vast and and on on bunch of grenades and everything. And they were laying down all over. So when we picked up the stretchers, we were walking in between grenades and and RPG rockets. Uh, super dangerous, by the way. The military cleared it out same day, but um, um, it's a war zone. It's it's that's what's up. And the smell was, um, you know, all of your senses. It's like what you hear and see and and smell. It's like all got into a package of a weird Mad Max war zone, and I was sure a hundred percent that we're starting at the end of the world that moment i was okay i get it it's over that's that's what was in my mind what's over it, the world it's over it's done that's 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 the visual i had everything is it's done um because if it, this could happen to these kids because 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 the way it looks like like if you type and i didn't do it right if you're gonna type the end of the world visual on google i'm assuming you're gonna see some stuff very similar to that couple apocalyptic visual photo i had in front of my face and um and alongside with this you get you know you're on your phone all the time so you get a lot of text messages you telegram and this and this and you and you you know you realize how crazy it is and you are there so so um that was um very um weird surreal experience and then we got to kibbutz Berry and uh how many young people died at the nova festival killed by hamas terrorists a few hundreds i don't know i um i'll be honest with you i um i have a hard time watching the news mm. I uh, have a hard time reading articles. I have a hard time listening to um, testimonies. I'm uh, I'm in my own bubble in this war. You know, I, I I'm sure you probably know a lot more than me. Mm. Um, but few hundred, three, four hundred. I, I again, I might be wrong. Yeah. So after the Nova Festival, you're picking up stretchers. Most of the dead Israelis and the young people have been cleared out. There's still dead terrorists everywhere. Where do you go next? Yeah, we picked up the stretchers that were soaked with blood, um, driving to Kibbutz Beri, five minute drive, seven minute drive. Um, as soon as we got there, it was a lot of Zaka members, like maybe 40, 50 of them, and we got divided to teams, and every team is assigned to different area and a uh, different house, and the military is showing you what house you get, and what house you are clearing out dead bodies from. And so, these are dead bodies of civilians? Yes. What did you see first? Um, a lady, she was your size. Um, she had no face. Um, maybe, um, she got shot in her face maybe 20 times. Uh, it's hard to tell. I just like, I'm assuming. Uh, whoever shot her, 
uh, made sure that her face will never be shown, like no face. Um, um, that was actually a house I was not assigned to, but I, I went with them. Um, someone asked help to open some, some door that had a hard time to open. But when I got there to help, the door was open and they already took out, like they, they were already clearing it out. So I, I got the, the chance to see it. And then I went to another house that I was, um, actually clearing out. Um, the lady, she was over 90. Again, I'm assuming over 80, over 90. Um, and, um, uh, she got stabbed so many times. I don't know how many times, but so many times. And I thought she got shot. And I, and I said, when we, we did, I was like, oh my God, she got shot. And then, and then, um, some other guy said, no, I don't think she got shot. I think she got stabbed and whoever shot didn't, didn't, um, they, they didn't, um, they shot, but you see the bullets, the bullets, um, on the wall. So, so we were like trying to understand what happened. There's full of blood all over. Um, where she, was she? She was on bed. She was on her bed. Um, actually it was the only dead body that we cleared out from the bed. Um, and then, um, so a couple, we took of, we took a couple that were in the entrance of the house. Um, I don't know how to describe it, but ev the skin was not a skin. Uh, part of the body, both of them were burnt. Um, a lot of cuts. The house was a mess, like a mess, like every every thing in a house was was in a mess like everything all the kitchen doors the closets like someone was looking for something aggressively like like in everything was broken everything was broken in the house like they were looking for other people looking for other people broke it by in purpose like some like like, like there was no reason to break a tv you know what i'm saying like 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 uh, um 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 a lamp, you know, things that, why it's broken. So again, I don't know it, it, it but most houses were like that. Um, the couple you saw at the doorstep, how old were they, do you think? Is there any way to tell? 30 something. A young, young couple. Young couple. And did yeah. they look like, when you say their skin wasn't like together, their skin? They were tied together with their backs, like both of their backs tied together. Like they tied their hands to together and she had, uh, bullets on her shoulder back him. I didn't, I, I couldn't, I couldn't understand what's, what, what's up with him. Um, I didn't really touch him. Okay. So I was, um, um, I was always, uh, the last one who's getting into the house and, uh, always, um, um, looked for the legs parts from, um, I don't know. It just worked for me better. I guess I was too coward to go straight to the face because you need to roll the body from the top and from the bottom into the plastic bag that you put on the floor. So you need to roll it a little bit because you, you kind of lift the, the part, the body and, and you squeeze the bag underneath and then you kind of, you kind of or roll it or just squeezing all the bag and then you put the bag like around. Um, so I was always picking the, the bottom part because when you pick the bottom part, you, you can, I was with also with this hat, by the way, uh, looking and, and not like only on my thing and not to see the, the, the face. What did the other volunteers you were with think they've been tied together was the sense that they had been tied together while they were alive and then tortured. What was the sense of the other volunteers? Always with? different, different uh, talks. They had a lot of experience. The people that I was with, they um, they work very fast. They um, and very gentle. They know how to look at things, but it's not their job. 
Like mm-hmm. they, oh, that's a stab. Oh, this is a torture. Oh, that's a burn. No, this is this. So um, they they talk while we are doing this. This is the this is actually the conversation. Mm-hmm. Um, what happened? And um, um, yeah, some of them were young guys, thirty something, and some of them were um, older, like 50, 60 something, and they were shocked even the 60 plus years old that they do that 40 years 30 40 they clear out dead bodies that's this is their thing you know every terrorist attack they're showing up to clear out those dead bodies and they say that this is this is um out of this world it's not something they've ever seen so this volunteer, some of them had been working 30, 40 years and they'd never seen anything. So and perfect. collapse and passing out and throwing up and responding to it in a very shocking way. Like, they had seen everything, but no, not this. Not this. I don't, I don't know if there is a lot of people in this glob that have seen stuff like that. So was it the sense that like this couple, this 30 year old couple at their doorstep tied together with burn marks and bullet marks and just attacks to their body was the sense that they were alive and tortured? That's how it looked like. Um, You know, you're trying to um, attach the story um, the story is there, by the way. Like, people know what happened to them, I guess. Um, I uh, have a hard time to match the real stories to the people I uh, I know, uh, to the people I recognized, because uh, all the faces that I've seen still in my in my head, and I don't want to go to the list of uh, name and pictures and the story of what happened and where it was and who was it. Um... This is uh, my uh, biggest challenge. Did you see anyone else that you helped retrieve the bodies of in that kibbutz? I've seen a lot more. Were there um, any children? Yeah. Yeah, I lifted um, um, a burnt baby that was picked up from one of the houses. Um, I remember when he um, when he gave me the bag because... Um, Okay, he, he gave me the bag because he was supposed to uh, set like a, a little, it's like a bassinet on the wheels of the kibbutz to put the baby I hold it and they brought another baby. So both of them in, in, in like a stroller. It's like a, so when he said that like something was stuck, so he was like kind of dealing with that. He was like, hold it, please. He didn't want to put it on the floor, so hold it. And then I hold it up and then he took care of it and I'm holding and you know i okay i got the point it's a baby but it was so light yeah. it was um it was so light it was like not the weight of a baby it was much lighter than that and i gave it to him as soon as i gave it to him he's like and he was like very heavily uh breathing he's like burnt baby he's like he said it a few times and he put it in the bassinet and then they brought another baby. Um, and I was like, I'm just, I was looking. Um, I don't know how I felt, but I remember that I didn't move a lot. And um, um, yeah, those are the only um, connection. I'm sorry, one more I had um, with, with, uh, babies in and the bags and everything and i had one more actually where we were supposed to look for kids we were supposed to look for babies and and any other body parts and we found something and that was completely burned completely and you cannot even recognize what is it it's it it, it looked like like a plastilina like like a weird figure and um i was the fifth one who got into this house and and i already heard him it's a dog no it's not no it's a butt no it's a leg no it's a baby no it's like they were 
hawking. And I got out of the house. I just left the house. And um, um, I don't know up until now what was it. And I, uh, I didn't want to ask. And I told him even not to share it with me. So um, that's the only experiences I had with the babies in Kibbutz Beri. But I was with a team who cleared out my team more babies the day before, um, the evening before, and um, um, after me. Um, so had they all been burned? Um, the two I've seen, and I know some were not. Um, I know some were not um, uh, beheaded, and some were beheaded. I don't know how many were beheaded. Some were beheaded. Yeah, children. some were beheaded. Absolutely, absolutely, because we we were we were signed to find um, not just beheaded, like other body parts too. So we we were supposed to go and find other body parts in certain houses so that they found, I guess, most of the body. But they are looking for more body parts. So so we we were trying to find, and um, every house that I um um was supposed to look for something, I uh, I always had the hope not to find anything. Mm. Um, and also with these uh, babies' uh, body parts that, I, that they wanted to find, I didn't find anything. Um, but I know that the teams, other teams, they invested a lot more time on the search than me. I was... Uh, um, In purpose, not a good uh, searcher, I guess, maybe. When you saw the bags with the burned babies in them, was there any sense of how the burning happened? There's, I've heard reports that the terrorists lit the homes on fire while the families were in their safe rooms in order to force them to leave or to kill them and burn them alive. I've also heard reports that they torched some intentionally was there any sense among the volunteers of how the burning took place? I don't know. There was also a report that was shared, and I don't know if you've heard this one, so I wanted to see if you had any information on it about a baby that had been placed in an oven yeah. and killed by being burned alive in an oven. I've, um, I've heard that. I didn't see it. Um, from the reality I was, it was very makes sense that they will do it. Um, that the I was not surprised. That. I, I, I was trying the whole time up until now to disconnect, to de get disconnected from the stories of what really happened. Um, I, the whole time I, I, I hear always, I heard always a different but stories not about, oh, I've heard someone put the baby. No, no, no. Oh, I just got a text from, uh, th 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 this is the conversation. I just got a, got a text from Moti. Moti said that there is a, a, a lady that both of her legs got cut out. And there is a team on the, like, like it, it, it's a live, live reporting. The reporting I'm familiar with are reporting of the person who found the lady or the baby and tell the other team to come to help. That's the type of reporting I'm familiar with. Most people feel familiar with reporting on TV, on the news channels, social media, Telegram. So I'm not there. I am not reading articles. I'm not watching a lot of the news, uh, some social media. I get all of my information from my friends. Um, and only if I ask. And when I was there, it just came, it just was all around. So I know about some reports. I, but I, 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 I don't know what's, what's, what happened in every corner. I can just tell you that, um, what was there was not human thing. It was not humans. I don't know what was it. What do you mean? It was not human. It was, it was to, 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 to burn a baby. 
how they burn the babies. I don't know if they burned the the the, the babies where it was in a bedroom or if they if they um, burned the babies in the front of the parents. If the I I I, I don't know because because some of the kids that were found was burned, but the parents were not. Mm. So so some of the kids that were found. Were in their homes were burned, burned but the parents were, were not. not and the opposite too so 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 it's very surreal to even try to understand what was there and what was the case they had many hours that they were there with them so they were with them inside the houses for hours the terrorists the were terrorists with yeah. the israeli members of the kibbutz for hours, yeah. families with babies, elderly, young couples. Yeah, one house, you see all the food even was still on a table, like like was a table with a bunch of food and kind of kind of not on the plate, like it's, it's like scattered, like 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 a monster got there and, and was trying to eat and and it looks like the, the chairs are away from the table, so it looks like people were sitting there. Um, so uh, all kinds of weird things. Um, most, maybe every house I got into had a um, 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 bunch of spots of uh, bullets, of sh like bullet shots and, and um, a sharpness of, of um, RPG rockets and grenades. Um, so you see the sign of, of a bottle in the houses, inside the houses, in the kids' bedrooms. You see stain of um, um, of uh, marks of of um, um, hands and blood on the walls, but small hands, like like small. You saw um, in kids' bedrooms bullets and small bloody handprints. So kids' bedrooms soaked with uh, furniture and mattresses soaked with blood. Uh, one situation when I got into a kids' bedroom. That a three bed, one bank bed, it's a three beds, one bank bed and one uh, just by itself, small, like a bed of like uh, anywhere two to four years old size bed, right? Um, um, and soaked with blood, blood all over. And, uh, and, and one of them, I found a dog, it was a black lab. And I remember I, um, it was a kid's bedroom. And all the kids were, I guess the babies or the kids were, I guess, be picked up. Um, and we were, well, we were looking for, um, that's where we're looking for other body parts. But I found, saw a dog, like a black lab sitting on, laying on a, on a bed. And it was kind of shaking. Alive. The, the dog, alive, alive. Yeah, it was alive. It was shaking and breathing. And I, and I was... I was kind of getting closer and and it was a moment when I um I'm like he probably saw what happened and he was hiding somewhere and saw what happened and um I teared down when I when I um when I saw it it, it was it was the only live thing we found basically a dog. A dog. And um in a village of hundreds of people. Yeah. Um, a lot of them being evacuated. We just got there. Uh we knew we we're not gonna find anything and everybody like we, we knew it's about dead people, not about live people and saving live people, but but it's like you it's the it's it's the only thing that was alive during the massacre, probably saw everything and stayed alive that we saw. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. um, and uh, uh, I was afraid to get too close to him, even though I'm, I'm, I'm a dog person, I have a big dog and I'm very cool with dogs. I, I kind of got closer to him, but very, very slowly. And then another Zaka guy was like, easily getting close to the door, boom, hold the dog, mm -hmm. hold him, lift him, kiss him. Mm -hmm. And the dog licked him in his face and he took him out and then um the guys from Okets, which is um um uh, a special unit that f 
uh, using dogs to um, help to find explosives and stuff like that. Amazing, unit, by the way. And they know how to deal with the dogs and they're amazing. And they brought him food and he was eating. And um, uh, so that was pretty much the only live thing we found. Tomer, what else did you see um, in the kibbutz? You know, we had a moment where um, um, a lot of, uh, and, and another, another dude with no fingers um, and the How safe old? room was 50, 50 years old. So his but body was intact except he had no fingers. He died from, um, um, they knew, by the way, um, about his situation from somewhere. I don't know how, um, the entire safe room was black from smoke and blood that blood all over, blood all over. And they say that, um, um, they cut his fingers, but he could manage to run away and locked himself inside the safe room. And, um, and, um, and he died from smoke. So what they do, they, all the safe rooms they couldn't get into, they burned the whole house around and they put, um, uh, tires, they burned tires from around the kibbutz. They got tires and they burned, uh, for the smoke to go inside the safe room. So a lot of people died inside the safe room from breathing, uh, smoke a lot, some that we cleared out. So um, this man, I know these things are so hard to even wrap one's mind around, but this man was a middle-aged man. He was found without any fingers. I think it was maybe two left over there. I was, I was not really seeing the whole arms. And he was found dead in the safe room from smoke inhalation. Yeah. But it was after his fingers had been chopped off. Yeah. And so the theory is they must have chopped his fingers. He escaped them. And then they that was the story asphyxiated him in the, they, in so, the safe room. So here's here's the thing. They looked for him. They they looked for him. Uh, the Zaka guys they got information about a, a person that in the safe room, and the information that he died in the safe room. So we need to find a safe room. It took us over maybe an hour to find a safe room because the whole house was kind of a mess and collapsed, like the ceiling was collapsing and it collapsed and, and it was very hard to find a door. So um, from my understanding, uh, and that's what they're saying, that this guy, he knows a lot about safe rooms and stuff. He knows how to fight also. It was very, um, they called him a hero and um, that he built his own safe room. And I, I guess the family that was with him, I guess on the phone or something uh, from the safe room, that um, they say that. I guess they gave the information somehow to the military, the military to Zaka, and uh, the safe room was hidden, and then that's why it took a while to find the safe room. Um, I got to the part where everything was done, and just to put the body, the bag on the actual uh, stretcher. But his face was exposed. I remember his face. Um, um, and yeah, I had a, um, I had a moment when um, the cooling truck was a chocolate cooling truck that we used to carry all the dead bodies. Um, we drove all the dead bodies from kibbutz Berry to um the pathological uh, institute basically so we filled up the truck and i remember we i was with a few friends over there we smoked a cigarette and then some of the guys said um okay so uh we need to take pictures of all the zaka is asking uh, pictures of all the dead bodies and um i'm i'm, I'm uh, we don't have all the pictures and i okay so what's the call to action like i was kind of waiting like, okay, we need to take photos of all the buddies. So, so I was talking to my friends, the guys, like, so what's the, what are we doing? Oh, we just need to go open all the bags and take photos of all the dead bodies. So we just went there, open all the bags. How many bags? 60, maybe. 
maybe 60. And Men, women, taking and photos, children? Everything, everything. Mostly, mostly, um, um, maybe three bags of childs, but, but it was a lot of bags with parts. Now, it's not a conversation I got into, but how do you know what part belonged to what when it's completely burnt? And the bags of parts and all these parts, are these blown up from a grenade? Are these hacked off intentionally? I mean, again, what was the conversation on the ground like? Um, torture, burned them alive, some of them. Um, different, different, every, every dead body had looked like it, it had a whole full story. Um, had one lady, um, that I pulled out of from a bush, like a bush, like it, the size of this table. And, um, she was, um, um, maybe 40, maybe, I don't know, um, a whole like here, a hole, like in the eye, just uh, like, just a hole. Super weird. Um, like from a gun? From, from, from a gun, but it was a big hole. It was a big hole. So I don't know what makes that kind of a hole. I, 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 hard to tell, very hard to tell. Um, she was inside a bush, like she was hiding there. And I pulled her out, put her in a bag. Um, yeah. Yeah, one of uh, um, the burn people need to pick up their ashes too. So when you put them in a bag, you need to clean the ashes from the floor in super weird. Tomer, did you or any other Zaka volunteers you were with at the kibbutz that day see any evidence of rape or did you hear about any evidence of rape? Um, so the couple that we, um, um, we picked up, um, the one tied together. I've heard that they raped, raped the lady before in front of her husband before they killed her. Um, I'm not, I was not very touchy with the dead bodies, but my um, Nachman um, was very, and she when they were very touchy. Um, you meaning examining the bodies? Touchy, the like they, they, they touch, they, 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 you know, they, they, they did the job right, you know. Um, they figured out a lot of things and they got a lot of information from the military about certain things that happened, about things that they know that happened, like footage from, from cameras and stuff like that. And they got the information and I didn't get this information. So I was very, I was the rookie who's not connected to their, their communication. Uh, and so I was always hearing the stories. And always filtering where I want to be closer to what and what I want to listen to and what I don't want to listen to. Um, it was very uh, difficult um, to. Um, um, I think I think the the idea of uh, um, not knowing helped me a lot. So it, because it was very difficult to when when you when you know the story about the person, it's much harder. So I, um, I don't know all the stories about what happened to them. I was very, um, you know, holding the leg, putting the bag very, I took it in a very technical way. I didn't want to, um, um, leave and say, I cannot do it when I go. You know, I wanted to show off and, and, and make sure that 
they're trusting me and they are um, helping in a way, you know, like <laughs> they don't want to be a coward, even though I was felt like a coward, but I didn't want to be a coward when I was working with them. So, so to handle all that, that chaos and death that you walked into, in a way you had to compartmentalize. Well, I was closing a lot of happening. my eyes and I, I was hiding, but I did this because I wanted to work with them. I, I really wanted to help. Um, and I documented everything and that was, was another layer to the whole thing. I documented everything, photos, pictures, and I shared a lot mm-hmm. on my social media and that's how things got viral. I always love it when I find companies that we can get behind because they're pro-life, pro-family, and that's a lot of the companies that we support on this podcast and that support the podcast. Everylife.com is one of my top favorite of them all because this is America's pro-life baby product company, diapers and wipes from everylife.com. These are great, ethically sourced, beautifully made and designed diapers and wipes for your little one or the loved little one in your life. And you can know and be happy that when you buy diapers and wipes from everylife.com, part of the proceeds go to support the pro-life movement to save babies and to help babies and moms. So go to everylife.com today, put in an order. You can do a subscription order, you can do a one-time order or a baby box for a new baby in your life. And you can get some awesome quality diapers and wipes for your little one while supporting the pro-life movement. Go to everylife.com and use the code Lila at checkout for 10% off your order. That's everylife.com and use the code Lila at checkout for 10% off your order. There are, there is a war right now in media, in public opinion, about what happened on October 7th among some people. There are some people who are insisting, and they're usually you know, pro-Hamas, or they say they're pro-Palestine, and they insist that many of these acts are propaganda, that this didn't happen. Even the United Nations Women's Organization has yet to decry, to condemn the rapes that Hamas committed on many Israeli women and girls and children. And, you know, what? what's your response to that when you hear that? And, and you've probably heard that already. I feel, uh, I feel like we live in two different dimensions. Mm. I think, um, I don't think, I'm sure, the denying is not a denied as, oh, we don't believe because we didn't see enough proof. We don't believe because we don't want to believe and we just hate you. That's what it is. And I don't want to hear anything else. This is what it is. And that's it. I shared um, a photo and a video of a dude that was tortured and burned, completely burned. Bunch of them, by the way. I saw, I, 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 oh, 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 maybe over seven burned, completely black. From the, from dead bodies. a fire in the home? Or? Fire in a home. Fire in a home. That, the, the home, by the way, was not completely burned. A partial of the home was burned, not the whole home. Like, like they the just kitchen, them the common fire. area. Yeah, they put them on fire. You can tell they put them on fire. So, so. Where were they found? Uh, inside, some of them inside the house, some of them outside the house, like in, um, in, um, in, by the entrance, there's like a little patios or stuff like that. Um, were they tied uh, up? Inside, uh, some of them were tied up, some of them were not. One of them was uh, with something on his mouth, like like very thick, weird thing in his mouth. And it was completely burned with this thing still in his tie tube, like blocking his mouth. Super weird. Look like I don't know what it looked like, um, and I share those things, those things on my Instagram. Like you go to my highlights, you're gonna see a lot of that stuff uh, that you probably didn't see anywhere else. And um, you know, I hear it a lot in the media, the fake propaganda, whatever. Right? If Israel, if Israel, the country of Israel, the IDF made a whole thing as a propaganda in such a short time <laughs> planning all of this, right? It's so many dead bodies too. Israel probably is the smallest country in the world. But as of right now, 
on, on October 7, on October 7, Israel was the stupidest country in the world. Um, on October 7. Why? Not right now. Why? You know, we are asking ourselves how it happened. I don't believe in jobs, inside jobs, and all this crap. I know how it happened. I now I I I, I get it. I, I I know how it happened. And it's very hard to explain, by the way. If you don't know Israel, you don't know the border, you don't know how what's the material made from, you don't know I I was in the military for four and a half years. I was serving in Gaza. I know Gaza. So um for me, you know, it so it it just it just it's just very surprising. We did not expect that, obviously, and that's why um Did the IDF underestimate Hamas? Yeah, but I, I don't think it's all of it. I think it's just part of it. I think there there is many factors to it. Again, you look, I'm I'm not. I um. I get my most of my information from friends who are on the field, so I don't see. I don't know how to look at the whole picture. I see in in segments, you know, and every little part of the whole thing. I I know some segments. Um, cause I don't read about how, like journalists and how they look at things. You know, I, uh, I'm not there. So but you're closer to reality in many ways than most journalists. Cause I you're was, hearing direct reports. I was never, I, I, I don't have a linear TV. I, you know, since I, um, uh, since I'm 22, I was 22. I don't, I don't watch the news. Um, not really part of my life. What are your friends on the ground saying about why they think the attacks happened? So why it happened? Or how oh, it was able it, to happen? It happened because of an ideology. Why and, and money and control and um, how it happened? Look, we never trained on how to block four to 5,000 Palestinian <clears throat> breaking the fence and go in. We were trained to block two terrorists, three terrorists, based on a history of what what happened. But you have when you have fifteen hundred Hamas fighters, terrorists, with over three thousand um, uninvolved civilians that are infiltrating into Israel and stealing and breaking all those houses, by the way, in Kibbutz Beri and everything. So, 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 so there's so, 1,500 terrorists. Terrorists. And there's over 3,000 C- civilians. civilians. also who got into Israel on bikes, on and bikes. Were some of these Palestinian... Kids, kids, older people, they got into Kibbutz Beri and and that's that's where I was. He was that's why I'm saying he was. And, and it's but, five minutes from the border. It's uh, it's it's on the border. It's on the border. It's on the border. So there are thousands of Palestinian civilians, yeah. including teens, teens and elders, kids. There's are, there's footage of kids with a bicycles are are going into Kibbutz Beri. Who are coming to pillage? they are coming still pillage, and they stole. Well, they stole a lot of bicycles. They stole a lot of stuff. From Do you the think houses. some of them were committing these acts of torture? Against I, Israelis? I don't know. For me, it's the same. For me, it's the same Hamas terrorist or this person who just got into uh, Kibbutz Beri to steal a little uh, bicycle. It's the same. What's the difference? And when you say you're hearing reports from friends on the ground, one of them is they weren't expecting thousands to come over. What are some of the other factors you think for why the attack happened? The attack happened um, because they planned it for a long time. They've been um, planning this thing, I, I think someone say two years. Um, that's what their, that was their dream. They've been raised on Jewish hate and that's why they did it. And they got paid for it. Someone financed that. Um, 
And it's got nothing to do with the land or not land because Israel is out of Gaza since 2005. Israel doesn't control Gaza. You can do whatever you want in Gaza. You can go in and out and, and, and Gaza could go in and out. Um, but um, um, that was their dream. You know, that's that's their thing. That's that. This is what they do. You know, that, that's, it's not the first time they slaughter people. They used to slaughter people before like that. But on a smaller sizes. Meaning there one have family, been... Just one family got slaughtered. But if one family gets slaughtered, you probably you guys probably don't not, not gonna hear about it. We know about that. Meaning Hamas terrorists yeah. have slaughtered individual families before. Yes. And course. coming and into kids their and homes. babies before. Yes, kids and babies before. It it happened before. See, I think the Fogel Fogel family. It's a very famous what situation. Happened with the Fogel, Fogel family. family. They slaughtered the entire family. Slaughter the entire family. I think it was a mourning act. And, and what year was that, or what? How long ago? Roughly. Caught me on this one a few years ago. A few years. And, few years and it was Hamas terrorists coming into a kibbutz. Yeah, infiltrating into the kibbutz was few guys, and they slaughtered the entire family. So it happened they shot before. Them. They shot them. They cut them. They again. I I'm, I'm not familiar with the exact details of. Uh, which arm they took off of who, but um, um, there's footage of that. And and I remember even the, the family around approved and pushed the government to release the footage to the media. And I remember we all were seeing the real footage in the media. Everybody saw it in Israel. The footage that Hamas took of their Hamas, ass. Not Hamas. Um, um, the... the um, Security. Israelis or military that got there and took photos of what happened and what, what I've seen, yeah. So you are from Israel. You were in the army for years. Your friends, your family, you have them, many of them still in Israel. You're a dual citizen. What do you think Americans don't understand about the existential threat that Hamas is to Israel? So it's very simple. It, it's very it's not it's not complicated as everybody think. Hamas control Gaza. And Hamas has sixty five or I'm sorry seventy five percent that supporting Hamas. Of right? Palestinians and Palestinians Gaza seventy five seventy five percent. Now, if I'm wrong about the number, please 73, 72, 71, whatever seventy five percent. That's what from what I've heard, right? Now, Hamas is, is Hamas, Iran, Qatar, all those countries that financing Hamas, they're feeding the, the, the ideology uh, to hate Jews and learn about Hitler and why the Jews need to be died since the first day they go into school, those kids, and not just that, since the first day they are born, they know what Jew is and why the Jew need to die. So this is this is the first thing. This is an ideology. So 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 these people are growing on this hate. And when they reach the age of 15, 15, they become terrorists already. 15, not 23, 24, 20, 30. 15, 14, they're holding guns already, right? So when you hear sometimes about uh, Israel uh, killed a kid, I'm just saying it might be a 15 years old who was with with AK-47, right? So this is one thing. Second thing, there's a lot of, um, um, uh, there's people who makes a lot of money out of this war, right? And that's my beliefs. Um, this is another thing. Um, Israel is made to um, protect Israel. It's the only Jewish state. There's 33 Muslims countries around the world. No one wants the Palestinians for some reason. No one get them as a refugees. No one... No one really helps them right now. You see what you see in the media, but no one helps them because no one wants to help them because everybody knows that it's a wasp of terror. Gaza is full of terror, right? Full of terrorists. Gaza has two cities, the one above ground and the one underground. They invested their billions of dollars to build those tunnels underneath Everybody's asking, everybody's saying, yeah, but the Gazan civilians doesn't have a safe room to run into. 
Yeah, because your Hamas didn't build for them. They built tunnels for their Hamas fighters to fight from. The civilians doesn't hide in the tunnels that they built. The civilians don't have anywhere to hide. So this is what's going on. And, and it's very simple. There is no, there is no, there is, there, there, there is no other way to, to, you know, you can look at it in many other ways, but that's what's up. And those are facts. Everything I say right now is, is facts. Now from experience, I was in Gaza. They shoot the rockets. They attack from a civilian places. Now I'm not telling you what I've heard in the news, I'm not telling you what I've heard on a social media. I was there. You were I there. I see it in my eyes. Rockets are firing from schools. That was, this is 20 years ago. Rockets um, were, you saw with your eyes, fi rockets firing from schools. I was ambushing, I was ambushing on a, waiting, me, myself, and I'm talking to you about 19 years ago. 19 years ago. So this has been going it's, it's on for years. Years, it, it's a technique. This is their, this is, the, this is the way they fight. They fight from a civilian's um, uh, sites. Now, Again, I'm sitting here and I'm telling you things that I was experienced. I was, I was, I was a soldier that was sitting and didn't get an approval to shoot the people, the Hamas guys that's firing the rockets because there is kids in the school and they're shooting from the schools. Wow. Uh, this is, this is, this is for us. It's, we, 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 the, the, this, this is what we are fighting with. Like we, we know that for years it's happening. This is not new. So your commanders told you you were not allowed oh, yeah, we don't to take out the terrorists shooting missiles at you from Gaza because they were on a school property with kids there. Of course. And the kids are playing soccer, like maybe 50 meter, uh, from, from, from the, the rockets that that's 19 years ago and the terrorists choose the school they choose the hospital come on they, they know we're not going to shoot look they're not stupid and why they know why doesn't israel shoot why won't israel because shoot? because we we don't take life of civilians i've been trained to protect Israel, I've been trained to not to take life of civilians. Okay, I, I'm, 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 as a soldier, as an officer in uh, ground forces, that my job was to capture terrorists without killing them. Capture terrorists without, without killing, killing them. them. Why? That was the operation. You don't ask why. Does Israel does Israel execute terrorists once they're no, captured? No, only if the terrorists are trying to attack you. Of course not. So Israel allows the terrorists to live, and they're not. There's they no death penalty them. for they, them. They get information from them how to get more terrorists, why to kill them. It's, it's smarter not to kill them, I think. Mm -hmm. But um, again, I'm not a decision maker. You know, um, I'm just telling. I think that is surprising, though, because my understanding is Israel hasn't practiced the death penalty in decades. That even the worst terrorists committing the worst crimes, most heinous crimes, when they serve jail sentences, they're not. There's no execution. They so, won't even execute their so worst. So let's enemies. let's talk about the Hamas leader, Ichia Sinwar. Mm. He was he was saved. He had a cancer in his head. So this and, is the Hamas terrorist who planned the October seventh attacks. Yeah. And tell us the history briefly, because my understanding is he had been released by Israel, even though he had committed horrible attacks and planned horrible attacks against innocent civilians. He was released back to Gaza. Why? Um, we had a hostage for six years from the second Gilad Shalit, and uh, we Israel had a deal to release a thousand twenty-seven. Don't quote me on the number again. Um, in order to take, in order to exchange a thousand twenty-seven terrorists, exchange with one soldier. That was um, Gilad Shalit. And one of the terrorists was Yechia Senuar, and in jail, which is he was obviously getting his degrees and everything in jail. Forget about that. He had a cancer in his head, and he was taken care of in Hadassah Hospital on the expenses of the Israeli taxpayers. Okay, hold on. So this is a terrorist, a Gaza <laughs> yeah. Hamas terrorist, Senuar, who was in prison in Israel. He was permitted to get his degree while in prison. Yeah. 
he was getting education in prison yeah. from Israel. Yeah. And then he was permitted to have his cancer treatment yeah. at expense of Israel Israel in their one of their hospitals. Yeah. And then Israel released over a thousand of uh, terrorists, convicted terrorists, including Sinwar, back to Gaza in exchange yeah. for one yeah. Israeli soldier. Yeah. And those are not stories from the newspaper. Those are facts. Th 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 this thing's happening. You and then what did Sinwar do? What Sinwar? What did he do when he was released? Um, he managed, I guess, the whole operation of Hamas. I'm not familiar with the exact title, but um, he's, he's the Hamas leader, main Hamas leader. He's the decision maker right now of who's releasing, what to do. He's, he's, that's the guy who pretty much does it all with his amazing team. Um, look, let's put my opinions on the side. I'm, I'll give you facts, right? As a soldier and as a person who was there, as a soldier, as an idea of soldier, um, we've been trained, know how to kill, like we know how to kill, but most, uh, I'm sorry, 100%, not most, 100% of any operation I had is to capture only if you get shot by someone or someone is risking, only then you're allowed to shoot back. You cannot shoot even if you recognize something unless you get approval. Even if they're shooting at you? No, they're shooting at you, you're shooting right away. But if you recognize something that was suspicious, you don't shoot right away. You, hey, let's say, like, I recognize something, um, and then somebody else needs to approve it. It's, like, it. it's a discussion. It's, it's it's not, it's not, they don't, you don't go into Gaza and just shoot everything you see. It doesn't work like that. It doesn't work like that. Why do you think so many Americans and Westerners are, I consider it, blinded by propaganda that says that the IDF is leveling Gaza? You know, this is apartheid. This it's, is it's also genocide. Very, it's also very simple to explain. There is only 14 to 16 million Jews around the world. There is 2 billion Muslims around the world. Let's start with this. It's a number game. Now, they understand that the Hamas cannot fight the IDF. They can't. Come on, IDF is much stronger, much smarter, much stronger than Hamas, no doubt. So they fight around the world to put a pressure on Israel because Israel is a, is a country, it's a Western country, it's a democratic country that listen, that doesn't do what it wants. And they know that they know the, the good heart of the Jews. They know that the Jews have good heart. They know the Jews celebrate life. You cannot fight with someone that celebrate death when you celebrate life, when you celebrate life. There, there, there is no, there is no, well, first of all, there is no even a way to do peace with, to create peace with this. There is no way to fight with someone that he's okay. I'm sorry, not okay. He was raised to blow himself and kill as many Jews as possible. It's not a regular war. So, so why are a lot of people around the world don't, because, because most, it's a, it's a number game. Two billions, they have the, the, the bunch of teams in Iran and Russia and whatever that hundreds and thousands at their job. Their job is how to make Israel to be the most hated country in the world, how to make it on, on the media. So, and So you're saying there are thousands, potentially more, of people connected with the Palestinian effort, let's call it, um, terrorists included, who are their focus is a propaganda war against Israel on social media, in media. 
look, the extremist Muslim world, extremist Muslim world, Hamas, Jihad, their ideology and belief is to eliminate the Jewish state from the map. That's their job. By any yeah. means necessary. By any means necessary, it doesn't matter. And, and that's their belief. Now, I, re I repeat, not all the Arabs. I have a lot of Muslims friends, by the way, really good friends. They don't believe that. Mm. that, that I'm, I'm talking about a group. Unfortunately, it's a very large group. It's not, they're not minority, right? It's not like a 1%. Uh, no, they're the majority. And, and they based their entire life careers in order to do that. Um, and they call that anti-Zionism. They call it in polite society. Any weird. They call themselves freedom fighters. They call themselves anti-Zionists, whatever. And they 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 paint themselves in in different colors to look better in front of the world. And it's work for them. Working for them. It's, it's, yeah. Why do you think it's working for them? Because um, humans are like herd of sheep, and we follow each other without even checking anything. And if uh, most humans, when they're getting 10 messages a day and nine messages of them, how Israel is bad because there is more people creating those um, um, uh, videos and content and, and this and that, and, and you get only one message about Israel is good, but because there is less people that's Jewish that creates all those videos, too. it's a number game. Yeah, two billion. Most likely, you said two billion. Two billion Muslims versus, versus uh, fourteen to 14 sixteen million, million Jewish people. No, so if you're getting nine versus one, obviously, most likely you're gonna believe two nine messages and video, different videos you got, not to the one you got. So, Israel has been painted as an oppressor and apartheid, and the Gaza Palestinian are the poor minority without future. Actually, it's the opposite, because the fight is not Israel and Palestine. Israel is fighting Hamas. Listen to this one. Israel declared a war on Hamas. The entire Hamas regime and the Islamist, Islamic State declare a war on the Jewish state. Who's the minority? The fight the war is not only in Israel. The war is also in Los Angeles. I got canceled. You got canceled? Yeah. What do you mean? Few people in my art life uh, decided uh, to live, not, not, not to be around me. So you're obviously a successful artist in Los Angeles. And after the October 7th attacks and your volunteer work there, people that you were working with before are refusing to work with you? A uh, few people from... Because you're a Jewish Israeli. Few people that... Um, from Europe and some from LA. I might be risking their other roster or artist because I'm... Uh, I became the political artist. I don't see myself like that, but it doesn't matter. Um, so I'm too risky for business to be around with. Um, if it's not a war, so what a war is. There is some Jewish people lives in LA, they got attacked. There is a, every day, there is something going on in, in Los Angeles. I'm talking about Los Angeles. What about Paris? What about England? What about so many other Western countries? I'm so excited when I can find a company that I personally like to use and as I've said before on the show, I'm very picky about my skincare. I always have been. It's been hard for me to find a company that I like to continue using. When I first saw and heard about NimiSkincare.com, I was intrigued. This is a pro-life, pro-family company. The branding was beautiful. The products looked great. And so I tried them. And I've been using them now for the last several months. And NimiSkincare.com is now my favorite skincare company. Their moisturizing cream, their hydration cream is awesome. I use that every night. I love their vitamin C cleansing scrub. They have fantastic products for all different kinds of skin and the ingredients are great. The branding is beautiful. And best of all, this is a company that supports your values. 
So check out NimiSkincare.com. That's N-I-M-I Skincare.com. This is a great time to order something special for yourself for the holidays or for a loved one for the holidays. And you can use the code LILA at checkout at NimiSkincare.com for 15% off your order this Christmas. That's LILA at checkout at NimiSkincare.com for 15% off your order. So since October 7th, have you seen more anti-Semitism against Jews in America and in Los Angeles? Thousand percent. Thousand percent, no doubt. What are some of the things you've seen or heard? Um, breaking into houses, fights in the street, um, marking David stars on my door, which I don't, I don't have a problem. I will do it myself. On your door? Not my door, on the other doors, other people's On other doors. people's doors. Yeah. Um, Bunch of attacks in the campuses. Uh, oh, the campuses is, is another war like going on. Like how 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 is it related to Palestine and do, do those people never even been there? Like what 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 happened when when Bashar al-Assad killed I don't know six hundred I don't know how many hundreds of thousands of civilians? Where were you? What what country where was were, that? Uh, Syria. Syria. So in Where Syria, were you guys? It was hundreds just, of yeah. thousands of civilians were hundreds murdered. of that was killed by Bashar al-Assad. I want you, you know my studio. Listen to this one. My studio is right in the front of the Capitol on the um, uh, the city hall in uh, in LA in downtown LA. Right in the front. For the past four years, I've been in the studio on the ground level, so I see every rally that is starting wow. in LA. It's starting in the front of my studio. Wow. Every Sunday, every Saturday, I see it all. I see all the groups from Black Lives Matter to right wing to left wing, everything. And it's so inspiring, by the way. Very inspiring to see all the different groups and every weekend is a different group. And where was the rally for the Syrian? I know about every rally that is going on in Los Angeles because I'm right in the front of the city hall and all the rallies are starting. They're the biggest rallies. Now, every weekend I see the Palestinians. They're, they're passing me. I'm, I'm sometimes smoking cigarettes and I'm like among them and I'm looking at them. So no rally for the Syrian people, no rally for the Afghani refugees that are being dispelled right now forcibly. Yemenis, no yeah, food, no, no homes, no. no rally for the Armenian Christians. No. Who are being Poor slaughtered? Armenians, Armenians are being slaughtered right now. for years. By the way, so what rallies are you seeing right now? Now, 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 Palestinians only. Um, what are those rallies like? Uh, I used to see a lot of Black Lives Matter. I mm -hmm. um, on the riots. My studio was there in the riots. I was I was standing in front of my studio, and all the riots were around my studio, but because, because I was protecting, you know, and and my my place. No one loot my mm -hmm. place, but. Um, um, LGBTQ, um, and all of their around different organizations, um, everything, mm -hmm. and and no, no, no rallies for all the people that died, you know, around the world. Um, no, nothing, zero. You said something interesting earlier about talking about the refugees. Uh, there are 33 Muslim countries. None of them want to accept Palestinian refugees. I think of Jordan, the Queen of Jordan, Queen Rania, you know, very angrily speaking out against the treatment, uh, how she sees IDF's treatment of Gaza. How dare you? But Jordan is not accepting why is that responsible Palestinian for refugees. Why, why is that Egypt not accepting Palestinian yeah. refugees. Yeah. And, and you said earlier, I said, why? And you said... It's a nest, I think you said, of, of or wasp's nest of terrorism. Yeah. So they don't want Palestinian refugees in their countries because they know that they will destabilize the country. That's the concern. Maybe. I. I don't know. I. Um, I know that everyone there know and see what we see. They they know all those are countries. But they have to stick to specific agenda, I guess. Yes. Because um, for a political side and money and power and stuff like that, right? But um, yeah, they have to stick to a specific agenda. That's why. But why wouldn't they help the Palestinian? Mm -hmm. Seriously, right now. Seriously, right now. 
They say Israel is Let, the one that must okay. help them. Let's let's say that Israel oh. is creating a genocide right now and killing babies, right? That's the, and slaughtering babies on the streets. Where are thirty three Arab countries? How come those thirty three countries not ripping out Israel? How come? How come? How come? How come it's only in the media? How come the pressure is in? It's like political pressure, not like how come no one is attacking Israel right? How how come Hezbollah is just a little bit rockets here, a little bit rockets there, or not like how come? Look. Why do you think? Because it's not true, everybody knows it's not true. <laughs> They know that they when know. Israel does precision strikes, absolutely air strikes on Gaza, that the target is the terrorists. And when there are civilian casualties, why are, does the Ministry of Health? There's the Ministry of Health and Health in Gaza. I see CNN reporting. I see Reuters reporting. Oh, Ministry of Health reports twelve thousand dead. What's the sense of that? Do you do you, you know. you've been in war with Hamas before? What's your sense of that? So. It's a great question. You know how much time it takes in a massacre to understand how many died, how many missing, and how many got hurt? It takes time. Their reports are so quick. <laughs> like one one bomb on the Shifa hospital, which was not from Israel, was was actually firing from the Jihad and, and, and had a failure and dropped on the Shifa hospital with the admit already. Less than an hour, they said 500 got killed. Really? In less than an hour, you count 500 dead bodies? Come on, bro. It's probably going to take you a week. A week to count 500 killed. Like people. They say, killed. well, the United Nations approves our numbers. So they must be true. The Look. UN aid organization says our numbers have been accurate. So they must be true. Is their response to that? So they can say whatever they want. They're saying many things. The 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 the, the health organizations, whatever, controlled by who in Gaza? By by the way, nothing. There is nothing that is going on in Gaza without Hamas. Nothing. There is nothing. You cannot operate in Gaza and do whatever you want in Gaza without without con the connection to Hamas. So Hamas is basically controlling those numbers. And obviously, I will not trust these people who are behaving people and torturing and raping to give the right numbers of who got killed. Do you think that the terrorists, Hamas terrorists and some of their leaders intentionally do not evacuate their families while they know that there will be strikes upon their bases where they keep their families, including I don't their think, children. I don't think I know that for fact. I know that I, I know that for fact that's their technique to fight among civilians because they know that this is the the um, um, this is what makes Israel. The bad person. That's their Achilles that's, heel. That that that's that's their that's their strength. That's their technique. It's a weird war. It's, it's weird not. War. It, it, it it's a psychological war. You know that not only the Hamas is involved in this. Um, the poor Palestinian people are just puppets. You know, I feel bad for them. By the way, especially the children. Hell yeah, they are born to probably die, <laughs> you know, um, and... When you said earlier that they're raised from a young age, the Palestinian children in Gaza, particularly to hate Jews, I've seen some of the videos and photos of young school plays. We're talking like first grade. They dress up as jihad to go, jihadis to go and attack. You know, they have a Jew, they pretend they're stabbing a Jew as part of this play that they're acting out of freedom, resistance, they, yeah. they, they think of it as. Is there anything more you can share about that that you think Americans don't understand about how Palestinian children are raised? You know. And I want to say here too, because people listening, there's so much confusion around this. This doesn't mean the Palestinian child is guilty or should be killed. 
they are innocent and they are brainwashed and they should be freed from this kind of ideology and from this leadership. I think that most people don't want to know. And I think um, people supporting agendas based on their surrounding, based on their jobs, based on their career. I don't think people supporting based on facts. I don't think people reading facts. I don't think people even doing the research. Um, I, I, um, I strongly believe that um, there's a lot of Jew hates out there. It's very easy to hate this, the, the, the smarter person that uh, uh, has been everybody's saying control the world. I don't, I don't even understand who, 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 who is these people, Jewish people that control the world. Please, I, I, I want to meet them because, because my life very far from, from being uh, controlling the world. <laughs> okay. Um, and I'm not, I'm not acting as a victim. I'm, I'm who, who are the Jewish people who control the world? I'm, 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 I'm trying to understand who are these people, you know? So, so, so it's very easy to um, to um, listen to the um, poor people, and, you know all those videos of 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 the poor Palestinian people that are um, you know and and after the bombing and everything they're like lifting the rocks and I lost my house and everything. There are so many layers to it that people don't even understand and want to investigate. So it's easier to hate the stronger. It's easier to hate the stronger and the smarter. It is, and um, um, and people are relying on their what will sound better to my surrounding. Who am I supporting? Most people don't have the balls to say, "Hey, you know what?" To the surrounding, I actually know better. I actually think different, and that's why I say it's a herd of sheep following each other and unfortunately they are a big part of um, the Jewish hate now in this world and they are responsible for many people who got killed also so that's why I am strongly believe that the war is around the world and people getting killed because that people are so um, all haters or, or, or just don't want to know, um, or, 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 um, um, for their agenda, they, they cannot say what they think is the truth. Tomer, uh, this has been an incredible interview. I have just a few more questions. I mean, we could talk, I think all day, there's so much to this conversation, but, uh, what is your take on these calls for a ceasefire? They say, you know, Israel is harming civilians, ceasefire, ceasefire. Well, what's going to happen after ceasefire? They say, well, use diplomacy, just use diplomacy. What's your opinion on that? Up until I uh, met my wife, I would uh, answer your question in very, you know, um, straightforward way, but she always, um, you know, don't ever listen to what people say try to listen to what they mean when they say what they say and and let's talk about when people say ceasefire it's a great slogan slogan it's like you want to put it on a t-shirt because when you wear a t-shirt that says ceasefire you become the peace of love person right but that's not a case people who are calling ceasefire it's not because they want peace and love. People are calling ceasefire. It's people that want Hamas to continue with their atrocities. And that's it. That's it. That's exactly what it says. People that say ceasefire, they're saying Israel is not, uh, uh, um, uh, we, we don't want Israel to get their hostages back. The slogan ceasefire sounds a lot better than the slogan bring the hostages back home. There was because a there was a short term truce and during that time in exchange for you know dozens of Palestinian 
prisoners, many who had committed or collaborated in acts of terror, Israel exchanged 30 per day for 13 Israeli hostages and got back, I think, almost 100. But then I understand Hamas started firing again, broke the ceasefire, and now Israel has resumed its attacks as well. So I've been uh, in Gaza as a soldier during ceasefires. I don't know about one, one ceasefires out of hundreds that Israel had in the past in my lifetime that Hamas didn't break. One, one. It's another thing that people don't know, you know. There was a ceasefire on October yeah. 7th. Yeah, well, you know, and, and, and they broke it too. So, um, ceasefire is basically telling Israel, you not going to get your hostages back and Hamas will shoot, keep the atrocity because as soon as Israel will, will put their weapons down, there is no more Jewish state. And the opposite is if Hamas will put their weapon down, will now be attacking on Gaza. And we are not even attacking Gaza, we are attacking Hamas. So, so this cost, concept is, for me, it's very simple. Mm -hmm. It's very simple for me to understand it, you know, because we always say it's complicated, it's complicated. For me, it's very simple um, because I've been there. I, I, I grew up in Southeast Jerusalem. I know the, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict from my home, like I grew up to it, you know? So I see it, I see what's going on. I see the two sides. I have a lot of Muslims friends, um, but anyway, yeah, it's uh, an interesting one. So it sounds like in this case, because this was unprecedented, more deaths and horrors, I mean, the most since the Holocaust for the Jewish people on October 7th, this is it. They can't continue to allow. IDF Israel is saying we cannot continue to allow this to go on. Hamas must be defeated once and for all. I wish and I hope that Israel and the IDF will stick to their promise to eliminate Hamas and will not go out of Gaza. And I said with a very heavy heart, by the way, uh, Gaza is not a fun place to be for soldiers. I can tell you that as a soldier, I didn't want to go into Gaza. Why not? It's it's dangerous. It's 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 every in my time every corner was was with uh, uh, improvised uh, explosive devices. Every corner. And as a soldier, I didn't want to die. I I wanted to leave. You know, yeah, okay, I'll die for my country. But I didn't go to the military to die. You know, I went to the military because because I wanted to protect the country, not because I wanted to die. You know, we want to live. We 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 truly want peace. We we want to live in peace, and Israel can live in peace. So, do you have proof? Israel has two million Arabs inside Israel right now. Two million Arabs in Israel. Inside Israel, Israel, you know, they're, they're saying Israel is apartheid. Oh, oh, apartheid! You have you have two million Arabs inside Israel. They serve in the military. They're police officers. They're doctors. By the way, you know, you're going to a doctor in Israel. Seventy percent chances you're going to see an Arab uh, doctor. Seventy percent of doctors. Yeah, I'm, in I'm, I'm saying seventy percent because the, the reason I'm saying seventy percent because one time was something about Israel. Every time uh, um, there was every time I went to a visit to Israel, every time I went to um, um, a doctor was Arab doctor. Which again, man, no, not not that I have a problem with that. I'm, it's just showing you that the there, 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 is, there is there is there is there is Arabs, Muslims, Arabs in the Knesset, in the Parliament, in the Supreme Court. What about it? What are you talking about? People that saying that they, they they've never been in Israel. Are there Jewish people living peacefully in Gaza? No. Of are there not. Jewish people living peacefully in the West Bank? No. But there are Palestinian well, you're not and Arab. To go to. You're not even allowed to go. No. But there's Palestinian and Arab people living peacefully in Israel. A lot. And by the way, we used to go to when I was a kid. Um, in the Hades. Um, 
I remember um, we went to Kalkilia, we went to Hebron, we went to with the West Bank to eat hummus. It was really fun. It was great until the second intifada. What was that? Um, 2000, 2001. That when, that's when I was in the military, by the way. I was in the second intifada in the Humat Bagan operation, which was one of the craziest um, operations in Israel. You know, the second intifada was very hard for soldiers. So this was an uprising. As, uh, and, and when you say intifada for people, Americans who may not understand, this was an uprising in the West Bank against Israel. Yeah. Military, militaristic uprising. Yeah. And terrorist attacks. Yes. And so Israel responds, you're in the military at the time. But before that, people would pass freely between the West Bank and Israel. Yeah, yeah. There's a um, a now becoming more famous on social media. He is of Jewish descent, but he's very anti-Israel. And his name is Norman Finkelstein. You probably maybe have heard of him, but... Heard the name. But he says the Infitata was not violent. It was merely an attempt to take back, you know, land, but they only would use violence to protect themselves. I mean, this is the narrative. There is nothing related to land. It could nothing to do with land. It was it was not not violent. Terrorist attack every other day in every corner in Israel. You saw you saw this or you heard you were you were alive at this time. I was up north and um it was uh, Passover, and when uh, I got released to go home, um, I was stationed up north, uh, Dove Mountain. Um, and um, it was um, Passover night. I was on my way to my uh, uh, mother family in Netanya. It's a city in the center of Israel uh, on the coast. And um, and I was late to the, to the settle, to the dinner. And I, as soon as I got in, I got a message that I got to go back and there was probably a war starting because there is a terrorist attack in Netanya, the same city I stepped into. And I don't remember how many people got killed, but um, uh, one of my, um, it was Park Hotel that the the restaurant, I don't know if the restaurant owner or one of the uh, manager of the hotel was the father of the family of, 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 of father of one of my best friends from the military. So um, um, I went back, and um, and the second the the Hamat Magendi operation started uh, a day after already. So we went back to the military, and uh, we after a few weeks, we, a few days, I'm sorry, we went down to Jenin, and we were fighting in Jenin for a few months, um, and that was the second Intifada, uh, very violent, very a lot of a lot of Jewish people got got killed, murdered. Tomer, what do you think is? Do you have an opinion on what the solution is? Overcome, defeat Hamas, then what? Um, you know, I uh, everything I um, I'm talking about. I'm talking from experience because I grew up to it, not because I'm reading or investigating the political side how to resolve it. I can tell you, thousand percent as a person who was growing up with Muslims in between two villages in Southeast Jerusalem, Tulbacher and Jabal Mukaber, and as a person who understand uh, the language, um, as a person who understand the culture, I was going into a mosque almost every weekend because I was playing with uh, my friends, the Arabs that was growing up next to me. I can tell you 100%, and I'm not, I'm not representing Israel. Israel. I'm not representing my country in, in, in a political way. I represent my culture. And I can tell you that the day that people will stop trying to think or educate or kill or want to kill Jewish people, that's the days that we will put our weapon down because we wish not to send our kids to the military. And um, my father, you know, when I was a little boy, I always ask him, am I going to go to the military? Am I going to the military? He said, I wish that the one day 
when you're going to grow up, you, you won't need to go to military. Mm-hmm. And I'm saying the same thing to my kids. You know, I don't want them to go to the military. And um, um, we, as a culture, we we do want to live in peace. But we will never put our weapon down as long as there is an ideology of it or to kill the Jews. You know, we'll, we, will, we will die for our identity. You know, it's, um, that's the solution. That's the solution. That's it. There is no other solutions. I don't care about any, any political, whatever agendas. The day that we won't feel that people want to eliminate the Jewish state, that's the day that we won't have a military anymore. And I moved to the state because of that. I didn't want to live in this war. I grew up into this war. I um, I had an apartment and I had, uh, when I was 10 years old, I had a knife. I was walking with a knife since I was 10 because um, a lot of Arabs used to attack us too when I was a kid. My wife grew up with me in the same street from the same neighborhood. And I know she had a friend that almost uh, got raped and she almost got raped. She was a sexually assault my wife when she was when she was young, and this by, is by by Arab. Muslims Arabs who has Israeli citizenship who believes that all Jews need to be need to die. As I said, not all of them like that, but a big majority of them that the majority of them are, and um, and we've been living this life. You know, and I moved to the state to pursue my art career because because we want a colorful life, mm-hmm. and um, and now after so many years that we had colorful life, we realized that nothing has been changed. Holocaust is back, and. And that's what's up. That's that's where we at. So I hope the IDF will finish it. At least the Hamas. I don't know if it will finish the ideology. What do you? What would you want your fellow Americans, your fellow Los Angelinos? Uh, you've shared so much important information. What kind of response would you like to see from? your fellow Americans at this time, you said this is another Holocaust now that you're facing. I want people to look at themselves at the mirror and ask yourself without no one watching, you don't believe because you hate, or you don't believe because you don't have enough proof. And if you do hate, you're part. You're part of this um, and massacres. You're part of this war, and you're responsible for this war. I think we got to a point when, and this is something people don't realize yet. We got to a point where. It's a silent third world war. And I don't think there is a middle side. There is there is this side or this side. Like a side. And just be honest with yourself and look at yourself in the mirror and ask yourself the right questions. Where can people, if they feel maybe they don't know, they haven't picked a side because they say, well, I don't have enough information. I'm confused. I see all of this stuff about how bad Israel is. So, you know, they say, I, I, I don't like picking a side. Where do you recommend that they go? Talk to Israelis who lives in Israel. Talk to an Israeli who lives in Israel. Who lives in Israel. In Israel. Talk to Israelis who lives in Israel. They know. 
Where can people find your work? You're using your art now to spread awareness about what's happening to the Jewish people, to Israelis. Um, so um, my work is in, uh, now in uh, downtown Los Angeles online. You can find it, uh, Tomer Peretz. Um, just Google it. You, everything will come up right away. Uh, Instagram, I'm very active on Instagram. I'm actually uh, having a huge art installation. It's called When the Music Stopped. Mm -hmm. It's about the massacre. Yeah. I'm doing two of them, two installations right now in Miami uh, next week uh, for Art Basel. And it's going to be South Beach and Fort Lauderdale. And um, yeah, that's exciting. That is exciting. How can people support your work? Um, it's... it's um, um, I think a uh, follow on, on, on Instagram will give you a lot of information because I'm, I'm mainly posting and active over there. Awesome. So uh, different links and how to participate, volunteers. And we are looking for volunteers. We're looking for supporters. Uh, we are looking for um, um, uh, people to come in and watch it and look at that. Mm -hmm. um, um, yeah, it's uh, very emotional. And we found we found it very therapeutic. Also, like it's very it's very helping people mm -hmm. to heal from tr traumas that they have. Like they got only when they watch videos over and they cried at home. And even if they were not in Israel, so a lot of people having trauma on that part. So um, it's very helping to come and see what we're doing because it's very um, it's putting you in in a zone and and letting you release release it in, in different ways. So. Highly recommend it, actually, to come and look at it. Thank you. Sure. Tomer, thank you so much for taking the time to talk with me. Sure, thank you. We'll link your stuff because I think people should see it. And thanks for your courage and sharing what you saw and speaking freely about how you see the events that are unfolding right now. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of the Lila Rose podcast. That was a one of the more intense conversations I've had on this podcast, I found Tomer's uh, to be an amazing person. I think he's uh, has an amazing story to tell. And uh, I think what really shone through for me was that he loves life and that he wants life and that that's what he wants for his family and for his people and for all people, really. So I hope that this was illuminating. I hope that it was something that was helpful to you. I really want to hear from my podcast listeners. I really care about what you guys think. I care about what you guys see online. And we will be doing more episodes on this topic in the future. So please email me at lila at gtbmedia.com. You can also leave a comment on YouTube. You can also leave a comment or send me a message on Instagram. I try to read all my messages. I don't get to all of them, but I read many of them. And as always, do not forget to subscribe to the podcast. You can subscribe to the podcast via Apple. If you listen through podcast app or Spotify, you can also subscribe on YouTube. If that's where you're watching right now, don't forget to subscribe to ring that notification bell so that you do not miss an episode. And I will see you next time.